Let us unite together in the public worship of God, and we do so as we sing to God's praise and glory in the words of Psalm 65. Psalm 65. We're going to sing from the beginning of the psalm. Praise waits for thee in Zion, Lord. To thee vows paid shall be, O thou that hearer art of prayer, all flesh shall come to thee. Iniquities, I must confess, prevail against me do, but as for our transgressions, then purge away shalt thou. <clears throat> Lest is the man whom thou dost choose and makest approach to thee, that he within thy courts, O Lord, may still a dweller be. We surely shall be satisfied with thy abundant grace and with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy place. And so on down to the end of the double verse five. Praise waits for thee in Zion, Lord. Praise waits for thee Oh, 
unite together in prayer. Let us pray. We have been reminded, O Lord, that thou art the God of land and of sea, and the one in whom men and women may place their confidence, and who may have an assurance as they do so, that their confidence and trust is not misplaced. We draw near, eternal Lord, this Lord's Day, giving thanks for another Lord's Day and the beginning of another week in our lives. Thankful that we are found in the house of the Lord, in the place of prayer and praise, in the place where God's word is read and reverenced, where God's word is considered and applied, and where God's word has the prominent and preeminent place. We pray that that would be how it would be for us today, that the word of God would have that most preeminent of places, that the word of God would be at the forefront and the voice of God at the forefront, and that everything else would recede into the background, and that we would feel the power and the authority and the uh, claims of God's word, that we would feel them uh, heavily as it were, even upon our own hearts, and that we would go away pondering that word, uh, that we would go away with food for thought for today and even during the week. The word of God would follow us into the, into the coming days and that we would ponder day by day what it means, what we have read and what we have meditated on. Assist us, O Lord, in each part of the worship and may the power and help of the Holy Spirit be much in evidence here this day. We pray, eternal Lord, thy blessing upon us now as we unite in prayer and make us a prayerful people and make us a people who come in prayer looking to the answer and looking to the Lord to answer our prayers. Make us a people who are thankful for every prayer that the Lord has answered. And as we look back, we see many such many such reasons to praise the Lord, and sometimes in small matters and sometimes in great matters, and sometimes prayers in regard to the things of this world and the things of this life, and uh, oftentimes too, prayers in regard to our soul, in regard to our spiritual needs and cares. How often we have seen thy hand how often we have seen thy grace and thy kindness. How thankful, how glad we should be today. How ready to echo the words with which we began our worship. Praise waits for thee in Zion, Lord. To thee vows paid shall be. O thou that hearer art of prayer, all flesh shall come to thee. And although we do not see all flesh coming, Although there are many who are not here, uh, yet we are thankful for those who are. And we are thankful too for those who are able to join us, whether by live stream or uh, through a later viewing of worship. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon each one, upon homes and families. We pray for those who are unwell. We pray for healing and progress. We pray for those who have worries and concerns about their health. And uh, we remember them, Lord, in a, in a very special and in a very particular way. Do good, O Lord, and work well as thou art able, O Lord, to do. And grant that in every twist and turn of our health and of our lives and of our families, we may be enabled to set the Lord before us and to be a, a, a people who look to him and who trust in him and who depend upon him as... Uh, uh, as we do on none other, uh, that we would be a people who wait on the Lord day by day and week by week. 
We pray blessing, Lord, upon uh, those of our families who are away. We remember those of them in study. We think of those in employment, uh, some of them uh, quite a distance away from us. Uh, but uh, they are uh, under uh, uh, thy hand, O Lord, and we pray that they would remember that and that that would become a blessing to them and that wherever they are, their hearts would turn to the Lord, even supposing they were on the other side of the world and some of them indeed are, that even there uh, thy hand would reach and touch, convicting of sin and bringing them to a knowledge, a saving knowledge of Christ making them new creatures by the power of God's Spirit, transformed in a way that everybody can see and in a way that uh, is unmistakably the work of the Lord. Ah, we pray that we would see more of that. We see so many of thy people taken home to glory. We see so many of them uh, becoming elderly and uh, frailer in their bodies. And we pray, Lord, that others would be raised up amongst us here. That is one of our great needs as a congregation and amongst us as an island community, that there would be those rising up whose, uh, on whose lips would be the praise of God, in whose heart would be the fear of God, in whose lives would be an eloquent testimony that the Lord, he is the God. Those who would demonstrate that in their neighborhoods and in their workplaces, and in their places of study, those who would demonstrate it to kith and kin, and uh, so that others would see and realize the power and the reality of God's grace and uh, God's might. Remember to that end, uh, each one of us we pray in the life and work of the congregation. We pray for the young ones next door, and we commit them and all that is done there to thyself. We pray for the congregations of our presbytery, the presbyteries of the denomination at home and in other parts of the world. We pray for the wider mission work of the church. We think of the work of the Trinitarian Bible Society that has been before our minds in recent days. We pray for those who are engaged in translation of the word of God. Raise up others who will be a well equipped to translate the word of God into their own tongue. We pray for the work across the world. We remember it particularly in Nepal and the doors of opportunity that have opened there in recent days. Oh Lord, we pray that a little one would become a thousand and a small one a strong nation. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon those who govern us. We live in uncertain days. We live in times of war and unrest in Europe and in the Middle East. We do pray, Lord, that eh, the the, the, that the Lord's hand would be at work and that violence would be quelled and that iniquity would be, uh, would be subdued and that order, uh, even outwardly, would be established and maintained and that furthermore there would be a, a blessing of heart and soul coming out of these things and we have seen it before and we have no doubt of the Lord's ability to do it, to take good things out of ill, we pray, Lord, for those who, who are most responsible for the direction of our foreign policy and our uh, home policy. We pray for the foreign office and the home office. We pray for the great offices of state. We uh, remember the royal family in their own position. We pray that they would, they would under the hand of God, be, uh, be, be a means of blessing and direction. We are thankful, Lord, for such constitutional arrangements as we have, which afford us freedom and which afford us gospel liberty. These are precious things and we do pray that these things would not be taken away. We pray for those who legislate as they consider matters of, of, of life and of death itself. We do pray, O oh Lord, in, the, in this coming week as the, uh, the debate on, on, on assisted dying reaches a, a, a crucial point. O oh Lord, we pray that that, that sense and godly sense would prevail and that uh, they, that we would all realize that these things are the Lord's prerogative, that they are not in our hands and that uh, we, we, we do pray that we would come to value life, whether in the womb or, or in old age and that we would see uh, the value and the, and the, and the, and the, 
and the worth of it and that uh, we would acknowledge the Lord's sovereignty and that we would not try to push ourselves into things that belong to thyself. To that end, we pray for the, the hospice moment and all that it does, and we are thankful for it. And we pray, Lord, for those who work in it and for those who serve in chaplaincy roles within it as well. Uh, those who deal with end-of-life issues, that they would do so to the good of the body and to the good of the soul and to the glory of God. Remember us then, we pray. Help us to, to, to meditate upon the word well today, that we would be kept from distractions, that even as we confess our sin, there would be a, a relief in our hearts as we lay it at the feet of Christ, and that there would be a restraining of sin and of Satan, so that he would not distract us, so that he would not break into worship today, that he would be kept at a distance, that uh, what he could do would be minimalized greatly so that the Lord's people would, would feed in the, in the things of the gospel and find fresh encouragement and find new direction uh, around the word and that any who are searching and seeking would, would find something to lay hold on, something to grasp for themselves in the word and uh, that uh, any who are careless and thoughtless and uh, uh, perhaps half asleep under the word that they would be brought to life and to wakefulness and to seriousness and to to soul concern and to to a consideration of the things that belong to their peace hear us lord and cleanse us from every sin and the glory and the praise shall be thine in christ forever amen <clears throat> Well, we're going to read in two passages this morning from God's Word. The first in the Old Testament Scriptures and the book of the prophet Zechariah. We're going to read a, just a portion of chapter 9. We'll read from verse 9. Zechariah chapter 9 and from um, verse 9. <clears throat> now here we have one of these uh, Old Testament prophecies regarding a coming king and you know these Old Testament people must have wondered often how and when this was going to be fulfilled Rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. When I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as a lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts shall defend them, and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as through wine, and they shall be filled like bowls and as the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty 
Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine the maids. And then in the New Testament scriptures and in the gospel according to Matthew, gospel according to Matthew, and we're in the 21st chapter, <clears throat> this is the corresponding passage with Mark chapter 11, where we're going to take up our studies again in a moment. But here's Matthew's account of that particular occasion. Matthew chapter 21 and at verse 1. And when they drew near unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straight away you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, and then we have a quote from that passage we read in Zechariah 9, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ox, an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And when Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased think they'd have been delighted. They'd have said, well, this is it. This is the fulfillment of Zechariah 9. Not a bit of it. And said unto him, verse 16, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. We trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing these readings of his holy and inerrant word of truth, and may he glorify his name indeed in our public reading of Scripture. <clears throat> We're going to sing now, and indeed this singing and the next one are from the same psalm, Psalm 118. We're singing just now from verse 15. This is one of these psalms associated with the coming of Christ and speaks of the joy and the gladness and the change that he would bring. In dwellings of the righteous, verse 15, is heard the melody of joy and health. The Lord's right hand doth ever valiantly. The right hand of the mighty Lord exalted is on high.
the right hand of the mighty Lord doth ever valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and shall the works of God discover. The Lord hath me chastised so, but not to death given over. O oh, set ye open unto me the gates of righteousness, then will I enter into them, and I, the Lord, will bless. This is the gate of God. By it the just shall enter in. Thee will I praise, for thou me heardst, and hast my safety been. That stone is made head cornerstone, which builders did despise. This is the doing of the Lord, and wondrous in our eyes. And then he goes on to, to say, this is the day God made. In it will joy triumphantly. Save now, I pray thee, Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he in God's great name that cometh us to save. That's what they were saying that day in Jerusalem, wasn't it? Blessed is he in God's great name that cometh us to save. We from the house which to the Lord pertains, you blessed have. And so on, just now, 15 to 23, in dwellings of the righteous. In dwellings of the righteous,
Well, friends, can we turn again now to God's Word and turning this time to the Gospel according to Mark. We come this morning to chapter 11. And we're going to consider the first 11 verses. Mark chapter 11, reading from verse 1, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, to Bethpage, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him, and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. They went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye, loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way. <clears throat> and... Um, uh, and others cut down branches of the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out and to Bethany with the twelve. <clears throat> well, here, <coughs> excuse me, here in chapter 11, we are in a new section of Mark's gospel. A new section commences here at verse 11. And chapters 11 to 15 recount the last week of the Lord's ministry. That shows us how much of an emphasis there is um, in the gospel account on these last days of the Lord's ministry. The previous several years' ministry takes up ten chapters, and now the last week is going to take up uh, eleven chapters through 15. So things are going to suddenly go at a much slower pace than they have hitherto. We are now close, very close to Calvary. And in connection with that, the last verse that we read there, verse 11, is very poignant. Jesus in the evening going into Jerusalem and looking around the city and the temple. And you wonder what he thought on that evening, what his, his thoughts were. Did you remember that visit those years before when he was 12? Did you recall the history of that city as he looked around and as he looked ahead to the momentous events that would so shortly take place there. And then as the evening was come, it's getting late, he goes back to Bethany. Now I want to say two things this morning about this passage. I want us to notice first of all that the events that we have recorded here are remarkable in their setting and rich in their symbolism. They're remarkable in their setting and they're rich in their symbolism. And I'll say two things about the first and three about the second. The passage we just read is remarkable in its setting. It's remarkable, first of all, as far as Jerusalem itself was concerned. Remarkable as far as Jerusalem was concerned. 
There was nothing commonplace or everyday about the events recorded here. Jerusalem had actually never seen the like. Plenty folk, of course, would have come and gone into the city every day of life. Plenty people would have ridden into the city every day of life. But very, very few to such a crowd, and fewer still with such singing and praising. This was unique, singing that old, these Old Testament words, the prophecy of Zechariah suddenly coming to their minds, suddenly coming on their lips. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In Matthew's account, and we read that account earlier, the word multitude is used twice to describe the numbers. We're left in no doubt. He tells us that the whole city was moved, saying, who is this? It caused a great stir. It created a great commotion in the city on that particular day. And here in Mark, we read in verse 9, that as they go before them and as they follow him, they're crying and they're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, praise to God in the highest. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he, as we sang a moment ago in Psalm 118, blessed is he in God's great name that cometh us to save. Now, no doubt, the crowd had mixed motives. No doubt, they were excited for a variety of different reasons that he had come. Some of them because they really understood who he was and what he was going to do. Others, perhaps more from a sort of national excitement that was stirred up in their hearts and fond longings. But anyway, they were excited that he had come. Are you excited that he came? What does his coming mean to you? Does it stir you? Does it touch you? Or does it pass you by without a thought and without a feeling? Is there, uh, is there a, a, a Hosanna in your heart this morning? Because Jesus has come. Are you glad for another Lord's Day? Glad that it's come around again, giving you the opportunity to worship Him and to say privately and publicly, Hosanna. Glad that you were able to be here when these words from Psalm 118 were sung. And did you sing them with your heart? Blessed is he in God's great name that cometh us to save. Oh, blessed indeed did you say, Hosanna. It's remarkable in its setting as far as Jerusalem was concerned. But it's also remarkable in its setting as far as Jesus was concerned. He was going to Jerusalem to face the cross of Calvary, and he knew it. But he's not dragged unwillingly towards the city. He's not hanging back. As we'll see in a moment, he's very much in control of the whole event. Nor is he simply compelled by almost helplessly you know the way sometimes you, you just find yourself helplessly carried by circumstances an external fortress no not a bit of it he's very deliberate everything he says everything he does is very deliberate he chooses his words he he orders his actions so carefully he's very much in control they're coming near the city, he and the disciples. 
And he gives them the strangest of instructions. He tells them to go and fetch a coat. Not because he was tired for the last part of the journey. He tells them to do this in order to bring about this triumphant entry into Jerusalem. In order deliberately to fulfill Zechariah 9. Go, he says, and fetch a coat. Where will we find a coat? Oh, you'll go into the village there, and as soon as you're entered, you'll find it. There'll be a coat tied whereon never man sat. How does he know it was there? How does he know it was there? How does he know the conversation that's going to develop as he, he gives the disciples a, a, a glimpse of that conversation? This may happen, and if he does, you say this, and so on. Well, it's possible that there was a prior arrangement with the, with the, with the owner of the coat. That, that can't be ruled out. But neither can the possibility that he knew it by supernatural revelation. But however he knew it, it was very deliberately done. There was nothing haphazard about it. It wasn't a spur of the moment sort of idea. The disciples go and they find things exactly as the Lord had predicted and they're able to take it and its mother was kinder to the young animal and it made it more manageable actually if you had the mother with it. Oh, you see, he's arranged it. He's, he's masterminded the whole thing. This triumphal entry into the city on this occasion, he's putting things in place. Oh, it's unlike any previous occasion. They no doubt had grand occasions in Jerusalem. But never, ever, ever one like this. And it all seems so out of character, doesn't it? The Lord had never done this before. Sometimes indeed he had, he had come almost uh, incognito into the city. Sometimes he would slip away unnoticed, unheard. On this occasion he does the very opposite. He's drawing attention to himself. He's making a public point. Why this triumphal entry? Well, that leads me to my second point. Because the passage is remarkable in its setting as far as Je Jerusalem and Jesus was concerned. But secondly, it is rich in its symbolism. Rich in its symbolism. And in fact, there are three parts to that symbolism. First of all, and I've touched on this already, first of all, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. Now that is explicitly stated in Matthew 21. You remember the verses we read. Matthew 21 verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying. And then it quotes Zechariah 9.9. 9. He had come to Jerusalem for the last time. And he wanted all Jerusalem to know it. He had come fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. And he wanted all of Jerusalem to know it. It was a special week anyway in Jerusalem. This was Passover week. 
And that week, the greatest Passover of them all would be held. The Passover that would end every Passover, that would fulfill all the Passovers of the past. The Lamb, the Lamb of God, would be sacrificed. Would be sacrificed publicly. And he overrules events so that all the eyes of the city are on him. So that people are watching and listening. And when he died, he died before many witnesses. I think it's J.C. Ryle who says that it's probable that there wasn't a home in Jerusalem in which the, the arrival of the prophet of Nazareth was not known and talked about that night. People would go home that evening and they'd say, did you see what happened? Did you hear the singing? And I wouldn't be surprised if some of them who knew their Bibles would have remembered that passage in Zechariah and said, isn't it strange? That's exactly what Zechariah said. And who knows? But that might have been the first stirrings of understanding in their soul that might ultimately have led them to trust in him as their saviour. Who knows? It was a fulfillment of prophecy. The care Jesus took to fulfill every single aspect of prophecy. And it's one of the evidences that we have for Christ being indeed who he claims to be. The way prophecy was fulfilled. Prophecy written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before. Fulfilled again and again and again and again. I was considering this morning just that prophecy. Out of Egypt have I called my son. And you know that must have, have caused the Old Testament believers to wonder what on earth does that mean? But you remember the way that was fulfilled. Herod's persecution forcing a Joseph and Mary and the infant Jesus to go into Egypt. And there for a time he stays. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Every last detail Falling into place. Well, is he your prophet? Your teacher? If I asked, who is your teacher? Your instructor? Would you respond instantly? Oh, it's Jesus. The Lord's my light and saving health. Well, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. But then secondly, the symbolism is this as well. It was an assertion of kingship. Children, that's a big word, assertion. To assert something means that you, you say it very clearly. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying it very clearly, I am the king. By riding into Jerusalem on a colt, he was deliberately fulfilling that prophecy. He was laying claim to be the king. Behold, your king comes, says Zechariah. I am the king that Zechariah spoke of. It's as if he's saying to the crowd, to the city, Remember what was promised. Behold, your king is coming. Well, here I am. I have arrived. I am the king. It was an assertion of kingship, 
on the part of Jesus, a king. But a king unlike any that had ever been found in Jerusalem before. A king whose choice of beast spoke of humility and meekness. Christian, mark this well. Because he says, does he not, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Have you learned this? Do you go on learning it? Are you praying that you will learn it and relearn it again and again? He's a king who laid aside his glory made himself of no reputation who took upon him the form of a servant he doesn't ride into Jerusalem on a white stallion because he didn't have a white stallion he didn't even have a coat the one he sat on was borrowed, and for lack of a saddle, he sits on the coats of the disciples. Again, I think it's Ryle who points out that this was so typical of Jesus. When he crossed the Sea of Galilee, he borrowed a boat. When he rode into Jerusalem, he borrowed a beast. When he was buried, he borrowed a tomb. And yet for all that he was and is a king, the king. Oh, a king brought low, yes. A king in the form of a servant, yes. A king suffering and dying, a substitute for his people, yes. Though he was rich, he becomes poor, yes. But a king. I asked if he was your prophet. Is he your king? Or are you a little like the crowd in Jerusalem who said we have no king but Caesar? Is Caesar your king? Is the world your king? The things of this world, is that your king? Or is he enthroned in your heart and soul? Has he become your king? Are you one of his people, part of his kingdom, one of his subjects, transformed in your heart so that you've come to submit to him? So, there's a fulfillment of prophecy. There's an assertion of kingship. Thirdly, there's a suggestion of priesthood. There's at least a hint of that in the midst of all of this symbolism. Now you notice what sort of coat it was. We're told in verse 2, it was a coat whereon never man sat. What's the significance of that? Well, in the Old Testament, the animals that were used in sacrifice were those that had not been previously employed in secular service. They were reserved by God for a sacred purpose. Now the coat is not going to be sacrificed. But it carried the sacrifice. It carried the sacrifice into the city. It's being engaged in the service of God. It's being used in the service of God. There's more than a hint here of priesthood and sacrifice. I asked if he was your prophet, if he was your king, is he your priest? 
Is he your sacrifice? Or do you perchance find yourself without one this Lord's Day morning? Do you have a sacrifice? And when the day comes that you will stand before God, have you got somewhat to bring with you? Well, the Christian has only one thing to bring with them. It's Christ and his giving of himself. His death in the place of his people. That's all they have. And that's all they need. Well, he rode into Jerusalem into the life of the city and into the life of his people has he ridden into your life into your soul have you cried hosanna he rode into jerusalem and nothing in jerusalem would ever be the same again jerusalem thought it was just another week it wasn't. It was to be the week in which everything changed. Forever. For them, for all of us. And if he's written into your life, things are never the same again. They've changed. They've changed for the better. Has he come then, this prophet, this teacher, who is able to instruct us by his word and spirit, God's way and God's will, this king who is able to subdue us and all his and our enemies, and who gives a kingdom to those who shelter with him, this great priest who sheds his own blood in order that the guilt and the stain and the disgrace and the condemnation can be taken away by transference. If he has, then these words of the prophet relate to you. They relate to you, rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes. Behold, your king has come. Behold, your king shall come again and bring you with himself. Behold, he reigns. Behold, his voice as the prophet is going out throughout this world today and it will never be silenced. Behold, the worth of his sacrifice stands today as full and efficacious as ever it was. You can say Hosanna. Maybe out loud. Maybe not yet out loud. But you can say it all the same. In your own heart and in your own soul. But you seek the Lord's help if you're able to say it quietly. Say it loudly. Because you imagine if those folk in Jerusalem had all just thought it. Had thought in their hearts, oh, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. But none of them had said it. It would have been a very quiet day. But those who said it quietly in their hearts... They're now saying it loudly in the street. And the Lord is no man's debtor. But if he has not yet ridden into heart and soul and life, well, the door is still open. A 
and he says to us to come to him and he works in our souls so that we are ready for him to come to us come Lord Jesus come the one who comes in the name of the Lord do not leave me without blessing do not leave me without a share do not leave me without a Hosanna. Well, may God bless his word. Let us pray. Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We are thankful that our prophet, our priest, our king rode into Jerusalem. We are thankful that he has ridden into many's a place since then and many's a home and many's a heart since then may he ride today into further places by his spirit and may there be a hosanna rising from hearts and from lips as men and women say i'm not ashamed to own my lord or to defend his cause Be with us, Lord, we pray. Bless thy truth. Forgive our sins for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're going to sing the remaining verses, and I've already read them or read part of them in any case. Psalm 118 and at verse 24, our eyes are particularly in verse 26 and 27, perhaps, but are they are all a part of the whole. Psalm 118 at 24. This is the day God made. This is the with you all now and forevermore. Amen.
Amen. Now, just a couple of intimations. God willing, the evening service at 6 p.m.